Okay, here's our lecture on sections 9, 1, 2, 9, 3. We're going to talk about Fibonacci numbers and spiral growth. So first we're going to work through this activity about bees and trees. Okay, so um, as a matter of science, female bees develop from fertilized larvae and male bees develop from unfertilized larvae. So as a consequence, a female bee has two parents, a male and a female, and a male bee has only one parent, just a female. So this diagram that we're going to discuss traces the family tree of a male bee back three generations. So here's our current generation, one male bee. And it was because it's a male, it only has one parent, a female. Okay. Now, this female bee has two parents, a male and a female. And then the male bee has one parent, a female, and the female bee has two parents, a male and a female. So this female bee has two parents, male and a female. The male bee has one parent, which is a female, and this female bee has two parents, a male and a female. And that's a total of one, two, three, four, five total bees. And then I'm going to look at the parents of each of these bees. So this male has one parent that's a female. The female has two parents, a female and a male. And this female has two parents, a female and a male. This male has one parent that's a female. And the female has two parents, a female and a male. And that makes a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bees. Okay, so let's go one generation further back. Remember, each female has two parents and each male has one parent. So these females both have a female and a male parent. This male has a female parent. Then we have another female that has two parents. The male has just a female parent. Again, two females with both female and male parents. And this male has a female parent. So that's a total of one, two... 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 bees. So if we go back one more generation, I don't know if I can fit all of these in here, but I will try. So female has a female and a male. Male, just a female. Female, male, female. Now I have two female bees, so they have two parents each. This male has just a female parent. And then female, male, female, male for these two females. This male has just a female parent. Then we have a female, which has a female and a male. Then a male, which has just a female. And then the last female has a female and a male parent. So let's count up these bees. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 21 bees. So let's just look at the numbers of bees in the far column and try to come up with a pattern for the next number in the list. So spend a few minutes, press pause, look at this, this sequence of numbers and see if you can come up with the next number in the list. So hopefully you've seen that each number in the list is the sum of the two numbers before it. Right? 1 and 1 makes 2, and 1 and 2 makes 3, and 2 and 3 makes 5. And 3 and 5 makes 8, and 5 and 8 makes 13, and 8 and 13 makes 21. So each number is the sum of the two before it. So if I were going to try to predict the numbers of bees in the next generations, I would say that 8 generations back would be 13 plus 21, which is 34. And then 21 plus 34 is 55. And 34 plus 55 is 89 bees. 
So if I look at just the number of male bees in each generation, let's see if there's a pattern there. So this for I, I typed them all out again. So in this first generation, I have one, and then zero, and then one, and then one, and then two, and then three, and then five, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and I get the same pattern. There's the same pattern in the number of males as there are in the number of total bees. And let's see what happens if I count the number of female bees in each generation. I get zero, one, one, two, three, five, eight, and 13. And I see the pattern happen again. So we see the same pattern in the number of bee, total bees, the number of male bees, and the number of female bees. So remember from the last lecture that a sequence of numbers is just a, a list of numbers. And in the B problem, we had this ordered list, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13. And we use shorthand to talk about any number in the list. So I'm going to denote this sequence with the letter F, and the subscript N tells me which number in the list I'm talking about. So F sub 1 means the first number in the list, which is a 1. And F sub 7 means the seventh number in the list, which is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, is a 13. Okay, so let's rewrite the Fibonacci list. It goes 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89. So if I want to figure out F8, F9, and F10, those are just the 8th, 9th, and 10th numbers in the list. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So F8 is 21, F9 is 34, and F10 is 55. Okay, so the general formula for the Fibonacci numbers, I'm going to use a recursive rule, and the two starting numbers are 1 and 1, I have to give you that, and then my recursive rule says that each number is the sum of the two numbers before it. So we're going to use the notation we learned in the last lecture. The nth Fibonacci number is equal to the Fibonacci number right before it, which we said is f sub n minus 1, and the Fibonacci number 2 before it, which is f sub n minus 2. So in English, this says that any Fibonacci number is equal to the Fibonacci number right before it plus the Fibonacci number 2 before it. So, if I give you two Fibonacci numbers, you can always find the next one and the one before it by either adding or subtracting them. So, F41 is equal to F39 plus F40. So, I'll add these two gigantic numbers, 6, 3, 2, 4, 5, 9, 8, 6, plus 1, 0, 2, 3, 3, 4, 1, 5, 5. And I'll leave that to you to do with a calculator. And then if you want to calculate F38, I can subtract F39 from F40. So F38 is F40 minus F39. Because to go forward in the list, you have to add, and to go backwards in the list, you have to subtract. So I'm just going to subtract those two numbers, and I'll leave that for you to do on a calculator as well. So I'm calling these numbers the Fibonacci numbers. That's because they were um, discovered, so to speak, um, by Fibonacci. Um, he did a lot to introduce Arabic numerals to Europe. Arabic numerals are the kinds of numbers we use today. Before them, uh, Europe used Roman numerals, which were absolutely awful for trying to do arithmetic. 
And he didn't really discover the Fibonacci numbers because they exist in lots of places. But one of the works that he's most known for is a book called Liber Abaci. And the original phrasing of the problem that he studied was in terms of rabbits. And it said, a certain man put a pair of rabbits in a place surrounded on all sides by a wall. How many pairs of rabbits can be produced from that pair in a year if it's supposed that every month each pair makes a new pair, from the second, which from the second month on becomes productive? So let's see if we can make um, a little chart of what's happening in this problem. So we're going to have this man. He starts out by putting two rabbits in a pen. And we'll say that they're baby rabbits to start. So I'm going to use little r's for baby rabbits and big r's for big rabbits. So I have two baby rabbits right now. So that is the first month. And then in the second month, all that happens is these baby rabbits get older. They're not old enough to reproduce yet. So in the second month, they just become adult rabbits. All right, in the third month, these adult rabbits that, that became adults in the second month, they are now old enough to reproduce. So they produce two baby rabbits, and they still exist. So they're still there in the pen. Okay, in the fourth month, the two adult rabbits have another set of babies. The babies that were in there in month two are now adults and the original pair of adults still exist. Okay, So now we move on to the next month. I now have two sets of adults that can reproduce so I'm gonna have two new sets of babies and all the other rabbits still exist. The, ba the rabbits that were babies in the previous month are now adults and the two adult rabbit, rabbit pairs are still there as well. So now let's look at month six. I have three pairs of adult rabbits. They each produce a pair of babies. And all the rabbits that were there in month five still exist. And if they were babies in month five, now they're adults. So let's look at the sequence and the number of pairs of rabbits in each of these months. Month one, we have one pair of rabbits. Also one in month two. Then we have two, then we have three, then we have five pairs, then we have eight pairs. And we could predict that in the next month we would have 13 pairs and 21 pairs, etc. So this is um, one of the... This is the problem that named the Fibonacci numbers the Fibonacci numbers. So some claim that the Fibonacci numbers occur in nature, others are dubious of this claim. I, want, I would like you to watch the Vi Heart video series. Uh, it's posted in the vid Week 8 Video Lectures folder. Make sure you take a few minutes to watch those three videos. They're very interesting and informative. Okay, so the next thing we're going to look at are ratios of Fibonacci numbers. So we're going to calculate the first 20 Fibonacci numbers using the recursive rule. And then we're going to fill in the table on the right by calculating some quotients of one Fibonacci number divided by the one before it. And I'm going to round all my answers to five decimal places. So let's start by filling out the Fibonacci numbers list. So I get one, one, two, three, five. 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, 233, 377, 
All right, so that's far enough for now. <clears throat> now I'm going to go back and calculate ratios of a Fibonacci number divided by the one before it. So F2 divided by F1, that would be 1, 1 over 1, which is 1. And F3 divided by F2, that's 2 over 1, that's 2. And then F4 divided by F3, 3 over 2, which is 1.5. And F5 divided by F4 is 5 over 3, which is 1.66666 if I go to five decimal places. F6 divided by F5 is 8 over 5, which is 1.6 exactly. So I want you to pause the video, calculate the rest of these ratios, and then press play again. So I hopefully you've seen that what happens as we calculate ratios further and further out in the list, bigger and bigger values of F, we end up eventually getting the same number over and over again. After about F14 over F13, we get 1.61803 as every ratio. Larger, we keep getting 1.61803. So that number that shows up, that 1.61803, we call that the golden ratio. And it has a special symbol, phi, which is a circle with a vertical line through it. And in mathematical notation, we say that as n approaches infinity, fn over f minus 1 approaches phi. So the ratio of a Fibonacci number divided by the one before it gets closer to phi the further out we go in the Fibonacci list. So this number phi originated in a context completely different from the rabbits or the bees and the question it originated from was what is the quote prettiest way to divide a line segment into two pieces? So here's a line segment we've divided it into two pieces we're gonna call the small part one and the rest of the segment x. And someone decided that the most aesthetically pleasing way to define to divide this line is to cut it in such a way that the short piece to the medium piece is in proportion to the medium piece to the whole piece. So I have this proportion where short to medium should equal medium to whole. And this would translate into an equation based on the segment I drew where the short piece is 1 and the medium piece is x and the whole line is 1 plus x. So this is the proportion and I want to know what x should be. What should I make x to make this the prettiest cut, and cut line segment I possibly can. So what I do is I cross multiply so this is something that you should remember from a previous course um, in algebra so I can cross multiply, so I have x times x, which is x squared, and then I have 1 times 1 plus x, which is 1 plus x. So I have a quadratic equation. In order to solve that, I put all the terms on one side and have the other side be 0. And then I use something called the quadratic formula. Okay, the quadratic formula is that thing, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Um, I'm not going to hold you responsible for knowing how to solve this equation, um, but I am going to show you how to do it. So my equation is x squared minus x minus 1 equals 0, and the quadratic formula says that x is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And in this case, a, b, and c are the coefficients on x squared x and the constant. So a is 1, b is negative 1, and c is negative 1. The coefficient on the x squared, the coefficient on the x, and then the constant term, negative 1. So x is going to be negative b. b is negative 1, so negative that is positive 1. 
plus or minus the square root of b squared. So negative 1 squared minus 4 times a times c all over 2 times a. Now if you just follow the order of operations, simplify this, you end up with 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2. And if I just look at the plus, 1 plus square root 5 over 2, that is one of the solutions to the equation. And if we type that into the calculator, 1 plus square root 5, put parentheses around it, or press enter, and then divide by 2, you get 1.61803. That crazy number that popped up using the Fibonacci ratios. 1 plus square root 5 over 2 is the exact value of phi. It's an irrational number, meaning it can't be written as a ratio of two whole numbers. It's like pi. It has um, an infinitely long decimal with, without ever ending or re repeating a pattern. So we call this number the golden ratio, the golden mean, the golden section, the divine proportion, about a billion other names. It's been studied since the Pythagoreans in 500 BC. So one cool property of phi is based on how it originated, because it is the solution to this equation, that means that phi squared equals phi plus 1, because phi is the number that makes this equation true. So I know that phi squared does equal phi plus 1. And I can use that fact to calculate higher and higher powers of phi. So let's say I want phi cubed. So I'm going to use some properties of exponents here that you might remember from a previous algebra class. To get phi cubed, all I have to do is multiply phi squared times phi. Because when you have like bases like this, you can just add the exponents, and phi squared times phi to the first, add the exponents, you'd get phi cubed. So phi squared times phi. Then I'm going to make a little substitution, because phi squared is equal to phi plus 1. I'm going to replace this phi squared with a phi plus 1. So I have phi plus 1 times phi. So I just replaced the phi squared with a phi plus 1. Then I'm going to distribute this phi, this phi to both terms in the parentheses. So I end up with phi times phi, which is phi squared, plus 1 times phi, which is phi. And then I'm going to make the substitution again, replace the phi squared with a phi plus 1. So I have phi plus 1 plus phi just replacing phi squared with phi plus 1 and now I can combine like terms phi plus phi is 2 phi plus 1 so that's phi cubed 2 phi plus 1 keep a little running I'm gonna keep a little running tally of my values of my powers of phi so phi squared is phi plus 1 and phi cubed, I just calculated, was 2 phi plus 1. Now I'm going to try to calculate phi to the fourth. So if I want phi to the fourth, I ca I'm going to take phi cubed times phi. Just using powers of exponents. The fact that when you have like bases, you add the exponents. So phi cubed, I already calculated um, in my previous calculation. Phi cubed ended up being 2 phi plus 1, so I'm going to replace this phi cubed with a 2 phi plus 1, and then I have to multiply that times phi. So I just replace phi cubed with something that it equals 2 phi plus 1. Then I have to distribute this phi to both terms in the parentheses, and I get 2 phi times phi, which is 2 phi squared, plus 1 times phi, which is phi. Then I make a substitution again, replace phi squared with what it equals, phi plus 1. So just replace the phi squared with a phi plus 1. I'm going to distribute the 2, and I get 2 phi plus 2 plus phi. 
and combine like terms. 2 phi plus phi is 3 phi, and then the plus 2. 3 phi plus 2. Okay, let's summarize what we have again. Phi squared is phi plus 1. And phi cubed is 2 phi plus 1. And now I have phi to the fourth, which is 3 phi plus 2. So now I'm going to try to calculate phi to the fifth. Phi to the fifth. Well, that would be phi to the fourth times phi just using properties of exponents. And then phi to the fourth, I just calculated, and it was 3 phi plus 2. And then I have to multiply that times phi. Distribute the phi to both terms in the parentheses. 3 t phi times phi is 3 phi squared. And 2 times phi is 2 phi. Then I make the substitution, replace the phi squared with a phi plus 1. So I just replaced phi squared with phi plus 1. Distribute the 3 to both terms in the parentheses, and I get 3 phi plus 3 plus 2 phi. So 3 phi plus 2 phi is 5 phi plus 3. 5 phi plus 3. Okay, let's recap. Phi squared is phi plus 1. Phi cubed, 2 phi plus 1. Phi to the fourth is 3 phi plus 2. And phi to the fifth is 5 phi plus 3. You might be starting to notice a pattern in the answers of being Fibonacci numbers. So the coefficients on phi go 1, 2, 3, 5. Those are all Fibonacci numbers. And the next one would be 8. So let's guess phi to the 6th might be 8 phi plus. And then the numbers that are just the constants without the phi are 1, 1, 2, 3, which are the first four Fibonacci numbers. The next one would be 5. And then we could also project that phi to the 7th would be the next Fibonacci number, which is 13 phi, plus the next Fibonacci number after 5, which is 8. So let's see, 13, that is which Fibonacci number? Maybe it'll help if I write down the list here. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5... 8, 13, 21. So 13 is the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7th Fibonacci number, and 8 is the 6th Fibonacci number. So this is F7 times phi plus F6. And 8 phi plus 5, well, 8, that's the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6th Fibonacci number times phi, plus the fifth Fibonacci number, because 5 is the fifth number in the list. And 5 phi plus 3, that's f5 times phi plus f4. And 3 phi plus 2, that is f4 times phi plus f3. So maybe we're seeing a pattern here. Let's look at the value of the exponent in relation to the subscripts. So when I was raising to the seventh power, I had f7 and f6. And when I raise to the sixth power, I have f6 and f5. And raising to the fifth power, I have f5 and f4. Raising to the fourth power, f4 and f3. So we could conjecture a pattern based on these results that phi to the n would be equal to f sub n times phi, because these numbers are always matching, plus the Fibonacci number before the nth, which would be f sub n minus 1. So this is a little shortcut for raising phi to a power.
but we just did this. V to the n equals f sub n times v plus f sub n minus 1. So in addition to the recursive formula that uses the previous two numbers to determine the next number, there's also an explicit formula that we can use more quickly to find, say, the 200th Fibonacci number without having to calculate 199 numbers before it. It's pretty complicated, but the fact that it exists is cool, and you can see that the golden ratio is in there. So if I want to use this to calculate the 38th Fibonacci number. I'm just going to replace all the ends in the formula with a 38. So I'm looking for F38. So this will be 1 over root 5 times 1 plus root 5 over 2 to the 38 minus 1 minus root 5 over 2 to the 38. And then I'm just going to carefully type this into my calculator, being sure I follow the order of operations, do anything in parentheses first, and I should come up with the value of F38 in just a second. Okay, so I've gone ahead and done out all the calculations. Um, there's a lot of decimal places, but if you go ahead and do out this this calculation here where I just replaced all the ends with 38s and you're careful to follow the order of operations you should come out with 39,088,169 as the 38th Fibonacci number. So after listening to this lecture you should be able to do these four things and that is it for our introduction to Fibonacci numbers.